Hello, and welcome to Let's Talk About It. I am your host, Taylor, and today we are getting into a new topic. We are going to be discussing a new young adult trilogy that explores an enchanting dreamland that actually erases self-doubt in the first book of its series. Um, The author will be talking to shortly, H.P. Waite, and she's got this amazing passion for increasing awareness about mental illness and why she also decided to have um, her main character in her book, Scarlet, um, live with the same mental illness that she did as a teenager. Uh, And so in the Band of Shadows, Scarlet discovers that she is a fae who is destined to help her uh, to help her kind, um, and along the way, she comes to realize that her diagnosis is actually one of her greatest supernatural powers. So, I want to kind of pose a question to you guys who are listening. Um, if you've ever been haunted by a dream, uh, one that felt so real that you wonder why you didn't give into your subconscious and live in it forever, if you've ever experienced deja vu so intense you knew it was your purpose to follow it to the ends of the earth so it can show you what is destined to happen. If you have, then Band of Shadows might be a great book for you. Um, In this Scarlet Onyx saga, uh, Waite follows the 17-year-old Scarlet, who we spoke about, who has never really felt a part of this world, and she bounces between foster homes her entire life, and because of that, she feels safer in her dreams, where she keeps trying to find um, and reach this mysterious door, but she always wakes up before she sees what's on the other side. So when she encounters this door in real life, she opens it and is actually transported to the island of Avalon, um, which is this enchanting dreamland where self-doubt does not exist. And um, she realizes that why she's always felt different in in the world is because she's actually not from this world and that she's a fae. Um, So it's it's a little bit of fantasy here. Um, And What follows are then her adventures into handling her newfound powers with care, all the while uh, being on the lookout for the Band of Shadows, um, which the Fae's kind of caused this big rebellion um, and it leads to their most deadly war. Um, And so the book, honestly, it's very, um, very fascinating. And I think there's a huge new trend um, kind of with getting into fantasy as we see, you know, things like Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones become super, super popular that um, there are a lot of things that we can live out in our fantasies. Um, and I'm really excited here to talk with Waite about how she kind of uses uh, Scarlet's desire of finding a place to call home um, and that expressing that home isn't always where you were born or where you live, but finding a place um, where you belong. So today we'll go into a little bit... Um, of discussing kind of how the characters uh, struggle with mental illness, um, which I think is something that a lot of young readers and really people of all ages can relate to and and learn a lot from, Um, how readers can kind of embrace their own diagnoses and kind of look at their mental illness as unique character traits as opposed to flaws or things to be to feel shameful about. Um, And then also kind of how to reach out to a friend, parent, sibling, or anyone that you can kind of trust and um, have a trusted confidant to talk to about these things. Um, And we're going we're gonna to discuss all of this with Waite, uh, the author of this fantastic book, and I can't wait to see where the series goes. So without any further ado, I think we should get into this, and I'm excited to learn a little bit about her as well. So welcome to the show, Waite. All right. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Um, you just got married, so I really appreciate you uh, <laughs> jumping right back into work mode and chatting with me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pretty good way to jump back into the real world and to yes. have a nice discussion with you. Yeah. I feel like you're you're balancing real world and, and fantasy world and, and dream worlds all kind of in one here. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a lot of compartmentalizing going on. Yes, yes. Um well I have so many questions for you about um about your book, Band of Shadows. And I guess I kinda wanna first start off hearing a little bit of your background. I mean, this is your first book and you're self publishing it, which like all the congratulations and like snaps and claps and all the things for you (laughs) because that's amazing. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. It it was definitely a learning curve for me. I mean, not sure that there's any sort of class even to learn how to write and then publish a book, but it's been a fun experience for sure. Yeah. I mean, I imagine like also 
a challenging one and not not always easy. I don't know. I just I would always think that doing that would be very overwhelming and and kind of scary at times. Yeah, it was definitely challenging and I think overwhelming has definitely been the theme of the last 12 months of my life. <laughs> um it I think that publishing the book and kind of all of the back end production side after finishing the book was 10 times harder for me than writing the book and I just think that that's because a lot of what how writers brains work mm-hmm. and just like being a creative person the publishing side like my brain isn't really conducive to just naturally knowing how to do something yes. like that yeah <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, on one hand, that's great. They get to learn some new skills, but also a bit flustering, perhaps. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. And then, so you also, you studied psychology, is that right? You got your bachelor's in um, in Southern California? Yes. I went to USC and I got um, a double major in history and forensic psychology. And mm-hmm. I was pre-law. I was thinking about going to law school and clearly I decided to write a book. And- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm curious if you can share a little bit about what that period of time is like between graduating, thinking that that's going to be your path, and then kind of where you're at now. I think that's always a really tricky, tricky phase for people. And even, you know, in your book, kind of writing to young adults, that that could also be a, a period in their life that perhaps that they're struggling with. Definitely. I mean, at 22, making a major life decision is pretty hard Mm -hmm. for, I mean, at any age, but at 22 to be able to decide what you want to do with your life almost seems impossible. So I had just talked to professors and a few other people like in like the legal profession who had all really kind of warned me about what I was getting into. And they all advised me to take a year off. And in that year Mm -hmm. off, I had a job and I was working and I really did enjoy what I was doing. But while I had a job, I had this idea for a book and I started kind of I wasn't working on it per se. I was more just kind of playing with the idea. And then I just decided I talked to actually my dad one day and was telling him about the idea. And he was like, you should just run with it while you're young. You can Mm -hmm. always go back to law school. You can go go back to school at like any age, Mm -hmm. but you can't necessarily always not be working full time when you have, when you're older with more real world responsibilities and kind of life coming down on you. So. I thankfully had his support, but that's kind of how the book started. I just decided to try and work on it Hmm. full time and it was a giant learning curve. But I mean, what I studied, it didn't directly apply to the book, but it very very much indirectly applies. Just the whole historical element and then the psychological element, Mm -hmm. um, both are super present in the book, which was important to me just because those are two things I'm very passionate about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I mean, your dad sounds, sounds fantastic. I think that's great life advice to kind of give. And I, I think a lot of people struggle with that pressure. Like even for me, I had just kind of been on one straight track with school and was just going to get straight into it. And then, kind of had that opportunity and my life went a very different way for a little bit. But I think it yeah. was very helpful to be open to that and to say to yourself, you know, yeah, there's actually going to be very few times in your life that, you know, in your early 20s that something like this makes sense. You're able to kind of do that. You could still have support from other people to be able to pursue these things. And I think it's, it's fantastic because you do see those two elements, the history and psychology, um, all kind of play a part and tie into how you've uh, wrote the wrote the story too. Yeah, definitely. I think it's it's important to always keep an open mind, um, just kind of with where your life can go. And it's great to have a plan. I'm definitely a planner. But it, if you don't have an open mind or kind of keep just your options open or your heart open or your mind open to things, then a lot of opportunities that you wouldn't have taken naturally would just pass you by. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And and one piece I I really am excited to chat with you about here um, is that in the book, your protagonist, Scarlett, um, struggles with mental illness. And I'm curious for you if you can share how much of that is kind of based on your own real life experience or um, experience of of friends or family that you kind of... um, that you absorbed and witnessed in your, in your own personal life and just kind of how much of, you know, what, what readers will find in the book is a bit from your own experience. Um, a lot of Scarlett's experience is drawn 
almost directly from my personal experience, uh, mm -hmm. me personally, and then just a few family and friends. Obviously, it's inspired by and not directly <laughs> yeah. any one person, but a lot of Scarlett's um, experience with mental illness um, comes from my own personal experience. She has a lot of the symptoms of depression and anxiety, and she is seeking therapy for it, mm -hmm. which is something I have dealt with my entire life and have also been in therapy for the better part of a decade. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that it was just important for me to have that in there. I've also seen so many friends and family members deal with various different types of mental illness and I just think that it's something that's really missing from like young adult literature it's more active in adult contemporary literature mm -hmm. but for people that are or anyone that's in middle school or high school what they're reading it's there's not a lot of positive messages about people dealing with mental illness and coming out stronger or their mental illness actually being a strength so that was kind of important for me to have in the book mm -hmm. yeah yeah and one thing I guess I wanted to ask you a question about, and I kind of wanted to read like a small little piece of this because you yeah. mentioned um, counseling. And I was very curious when I read this, if this was your experience and if we could <laughs> kind of unpack this a little bit. Um, uh -huh. But so this is just page 21 um, and it says... Scarlett was always a little on edge on Tuesdays. Tuesday meant counseling for Scarlett, and she didn't exactly like counseling, especially Dr. Keating's version. And then on page 23, you go in to say, Dr. Keating was the type of therapist who cared more about feeling accomplished after a session than helping his patient. He didn't care to dig deeper, to determine the root of the problem. It was enough of a victory that he had compelled her to display any sort of emotion. And that... That just that whole little section there with him, I found mm -hmm. so intriguing, um, and was was very curious if that was your personal experience in therapy, kind of feeling like your counselor or therapist wasn't super present actually with what you were dealing with, but was more kind of seeing your progress as successes of their own. Yeah, that I mean, it actually is. It's very similar to what my first experience with therapy was, and it was mm -hmm. a therapist that. I had I actually ended up seeing for about a year and a half because I had never seen another therapist and I just thought that that's how it was. But looking back and having had some exceptional therapists and therapy sessions since, looking back, I realized how like different and just how complete polar opposites therapists can be. And mm -hmm. maybe that does work for some people, but if I hadn't had people push me to go find a new therapist, I might have left therapy and never gotten the actual help I needed just because I happened to have a therapist that was like Dr. Keating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I get so many questions from people asking these kinds of things where, you know, I'm working with my therapist and, you know, I don't feel like she's actually helping me. Like, how do I go about addressing this? Or, you know, I just don't really like my current therapist. So how do I tell her that? Or, um, you know, I, I went to therapy years ago, but my therapist really sucked. So I just don't go to therapy anymore. Um, yeah. and it can be really difficult. And it sounds like for you, um, you have the support of friends and family, it sounds like to kind of push you to go back. Yeah, to go back and just try Not someone new. Mm -hmm. And I think a big issue for a lot of people, and I've seen this in a few of my friends, mostly some of my girlfriends, but they, you open up so much to a therapist and you kind of have to go start from the beginning and you talk about your childhood or your parents and past traumas. And even if you don't have a good relationship with your therapist or you don't think that it's working, sometimes people think that it's easier to stay in that kind of relationship mm -hmm. than it is to start over because they don't want to have to completely start from the beginning again and go back over all those past traumas. They'd rather just stay with a kind of subpar therapy session, but at least not have to start from the very beginning again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that entire process, entire process can seem very overwhelming. Um, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and I really appreciate and, and like the fact that in this character and, and in the book that you've really kind of turned all the stereotypes about mental illness kind of on their head where mm -hmm. these are like supernatural powers and these are things that you can use to your strength. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about what that looks like for you um, and, and what, what your journey has been with that. Yeah. I mean, for... I definitely drew 
on my own experience for Scarlett, also a lot from uh, my sister's experience. But for me, um, with depression and anxiety, I mean, I think my anxiety, the way that it's a strength for me is just how much it, in the beginning, it, I didn't fe- couldn't feel that it was a strength at all. But now that I've realized how much of a tool you can use it as, and I just, I'm so motivated by, like, I don't, it's hard to explain, but... Mm-hmm. It just, it really, truly motivates me in a positive way now because I know that that ang- a lot of my anxiety is coming from a good place to motivate me to do things. Mm-hmm. And for the empath side, um, that Scarlett is like her biggest uh, attribute is my sister has dealt with really um, intense depression mm-hmm. for most of her life. And she is so incredibly empathic. It's one of the craziest things I've ever experienced. Just she can be in a room with someone she's never met. And she's so like, she's such a highly sensitive person to Mm -hmm. other people's emotions that she can feel what they're feeling. And obviously it's not in the same way that Scarlett does it because life is not a fantasy fiction novel Mm -hmm. and she cannot control their emotion. But it's that same idea where she can connect so strongly with people on that level because of how sensitive she is to their emotions Mm -hmm. and it's like the biggest strong suit because she's just got the best interpersonal like relationships Mm -hmm. that you can imagine because of it Mm -hmm. yeah yeah you know I don't think I'd ever like thought of it in that way um but I think that that's a great example of how to kind of take that that can feel so over overwhelming and and kind of pull you down a bit to to realize that in this, you also have a skill that not a lot of people have and then it can bring yeah. you closer to some people. Um, I think just managing that level of output and that level of um, of input of what you're absorbing from other people uh, oh, definitely. is something to be cautious of. Yeah, def- mm-hmm. there, you definitely have to be very mindful of that. And I think that, I do think that having a, good therapist or a good relationship with your therapist really helps, or at least it has with me and people that I know in my life. Because Mm -hmm. for me, I don't know if I could have realized that on my own and kind of turned um, some of those symptoms of my own mental illnesses into the positives that they have been now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for for you, was this something that you started to learn throughout counseling once you kind of got to your your good therapist? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, definitely took took some time, took yeah. some tweaking. Um, but it definitely it definitely came out of some good therapy and I I think that everyone is different and each mental illness is unique to itself and unique to the individual. So mm-hmm. each person will have their own um just what works for them may be different, but for me therapy was like instrumental in all of this. And I just think that if I had had um, not just books, but anything in the media and literature and TV and movies where there were young people, especially young women that had similar issues to what I felt like I was having and then turn those into strengths, it would have been so empowering at a young age. And maybe it wouldn't have taken so long for me to realize how mm-hmm. to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess when talking about, you know, experiencing this anxiety um, and even a little bit of the depression as well. Um, What did that actually look like for you? I know for Scarlett, um, part of that manifested through nightmares. Um, And Mm -hmm. I'm I'm wondering if you can share what what that looked like for you. Yeah. I mean, I... I didn't really have that part is completely different for me. I had terrible insomnia, so I couldn't even have had a nightmare if I tried Mm because I was just up all the time. Um, And it was, it was very like there were times where it was very catatonic. When I was in college, I had a like six month period where I had to like physically have someone come remove me from Mm -hmm. bed to get me to go to class because I just could not motivate myself to do anything and. You just, for me, the depression really left me feeling empty. I didn't feel sad. It was more of an emptiness. Mm -hmm. Um, And then when I would get anxious, it would just be a very edgy emptiness that would happen. Mm -hmm. Um, But I mean, it's just, it's something that I still deal with. I just now have the tools to deal with it between 
therapy and meditation and just knowing what works mm-hmm. for me and knowing that getting out of the house is so important and working out every day and eating healthy and those things that you would think seem so just like obvious yeah. are actually the things that can help the most. Mm-hmm. And and when you were experiencing that in college, um, how did you know that that you needed therapy or what what kind of made you take the step to seeking therapy that first time? Um, I, that was not, um, my own choice to be honest. Um, okay, yeah. I, I dealt with it a little bit in high school, but I was very active. I played both sports at school and club sports. And I think that really helped kind of keep the major issues at bay. I kept the anxiety down a little bit. I wasn't feeling the symptoms as intensely as I did in college. Cause when I first got to college, you're kind of like finding yourself in my yeah. freshman year. I wasn't really taking care of myself and I school kind of came easy for me. So I was slacking off because I didn't feel like I had to try and I wasn't playing sports anymore. And it kind of just hit me like a freight train. Mm. It was after the first semester, it just barreled into me. And I had some serious, I, at the time I did not realize that it was like serious depression, anxiety that I was dealing with. I just was like, angry all the time. And Mm -hmm. I thank God had a very, um, amazingly, I guess, in tune 19 year old boyfriend. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know how, what's a rare to come across. (laughs) I'm that's, that's what I'm saying. I don't know how, how he realized it, but he actually called my parents and was like, I don't know what Mm -hmm. to do with her. I can tell she's not happy. And obviously at 19 didn't have the answers, but he was Mm -hmm. smart enough to call my parents and my mom called me and She asked if I would want to go to therapy. And at first I was very against the idea, but Mm -hmm. it was, it was definitely the right call. We are no longer together, but we are still very good friends because he was very emotionally mature at his age. Um, Hmm. But yeah, that's kind of how I, it all came together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then after, after that point, do you think you kind of talked more to friends and family after that because I'm assuming that before your boyfriend told your parents that they didn't really have any idea what was going on. Yeah, I don't think, I mean, no one else really noticed. There was a little bit, like a few people would be like, oh, I could tell that you weren't as happy as you usually were or you weren't being social at all. I was very like keeping to myself. And I do have, I've always had moments like that. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm obviously a writer. I love reading. I would choose staying in and reading a book over most things. But a few people were like, oh, I noticed, but no one did the way he did just because he was around me all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, But then every time that I would kind of have a more depressive episode after that, I realized it for what it was, which was kind of like the biggest blessing. Because when you don't know what the problem is, you can't fix it. Yeah. Especially when you're 18 or 19 and you're just like, why am I so angry all the time? Mm-hmm. You just think, oh, I'm just, it's just teenage angst if you. Yeah. Well, basically. <laughs> yeah. Well, it seems like it's something everyone's dealing with. So like, why yeah. should I even look into this? Because it's just a normal thing, which yeah, in, in exactly. some cases it is normal, but that doesn't mean that mm-hmm. we also can't take the steps to look into it and kind of better learn to understand like what impact that's having. Um, yeah. And so it, it sounds like your family was supportive of things like counseling and talking about mental health then. Oh, definitely. My my yeah. parents are very, I'm mean, not just open-minded in most aspects of life, but I mean, almost every member of my family has sought some sort of counseling, even if it was just a situational thing for mm-hmm. one thing and then moved on. But yeah. so it's it's definitely an easy, uh, it's easy to discuss like issues like that in my family. So I'm very lucky Mm -hmm. to have that. Yeah. And now initially when I was reading through the book, um, and Scarlett is, you know, kind of in and out of these, the foster system, um, I was thinking like, oh yeah, I'm really curious if she, uh, experienced this. And then I, as I was stalking you, um, (laughs) watched a, (laughs) watched a video where you were saying, you know, that no, you actually, um, your family was doing work within foster care system. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. My mom. Amazing that uh, you like were exposed to that kind of work too. Yeah. I mean, that's, my mom has been, uh, working with the foster care system in San Diego 
pretty much my entire life. So we grew up around it. Um, mm. And she works with a system called the CASA system, which is a court appointed special advocate, which are basically volunteer um, individuals who make sure that foster care children are being treated like well and fair and being mm-hmm. loved and they help find better fits for families because a lot of foster kids are kind of just placed in a family and sometimes the foster parents are just looking for kind of a government check and they may give them all the the necessities but the kids aren't being met with love or anything outside of the realm of food and a place to sleep yeah um so th- i've ha- i've been working with um CASAs and foster kids in the foster care system since I can pretty much remember and that putting that in the book wasn't even really a conscious decision. I didn't until I finished it and someone um, who my mom works with mentioned like how cool it was to see the foster care system written in there. I was like, wow, I didn't even realize like (laughs) that I was consciously doing that. I think it was just an idea that was so natural to me because Mm -hmm. it was something that was a part of my life. Yeah. Yeah. How is like, cause I'm curious, I haven't, I personally haven't had any kind of work or life experience around the foster care system. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering how that has kind of impacted your own worldview on and like a, a theme throughout the book kind of is like home and belonging. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm curious how that has kind of your experience with that has shaped your own view of that. Uh, I think it's definitely shaped it in the most obvious way is that I would be completely inclined towards fostering and adoption Mm -hmm. um, for many reasons, mostly just because there's so many children that are in dire need of a loving home. But I think what you touched on about um, the whole theme of home in the book is that I just really think that home isn't so much a place that home can be a person. It can be a place. It can be a feeling. You can feel it in your favorite book. You can feel it in your husband or wife. You can feel it in your best friend. It's it's just a feeling that can be ascribed to a certain aspect of our life that makes us feel truly comfortable and the most ourselves. Mm-hmm. I love that kind of defin- definition of home. I think that like it really touches home and it, I think, allows people to not feel excluded from just, you know, if you don't feel like you belonged where you were born and where you were raised, that you don't feel as excluded or left out if you if that doesn't feel like home for you. Um, yeah, definitely. I'm curious what what home is for you, what, what things or people you would say feel like home. Um. I have to say my husband. Yeah. Because <laughs> I just got married. Yeah. That's still a very weird word for me. <laughs> um, but home, I mean, I have a lot of things that feel like home. I think um, I was actually born in Iowa. And when I go back to Iowa to visit family, mm-hmm. even though we don't have like the home I was born in, there's something about being there and the smells that yeah. I feel so relaxed. Mm-hmm. And my dad calls it the lizard brain there's just something inside of you that like knows that this is a good place for you (laughs) yeah Uh, but then there's also just like I mean my dog I -hmm. love my dog when I when I was just away from her for a month I like there I feel like a part of me is missing yeah and then certain books that like mostly books that I read at a very young age like in those really like formative years Mm -hmm. um that when I pick up or not even reread, but just get little reminders. Like it just, you just feel that feeling inside that makes you feel like home, like so comfortable. So it's just, you feel yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I totally feel you on the, on the animal piece. Um, I have a cat and yeah, being with her is, I feel so at home. And when I'm away from her, it's like literally a piece of me is missing and I'm like, oh, like I miss you so much. I know. Um, it's the worst feeling because you can't even talk to them. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It's so shitty. Um, <laughs> and then you mentioned Iowa. I'm curious what part of Iowa. Um, Sioux City, Iowa. 
Okay. I was like so big. I have my stepfather is from Iowa and they have a family farm there. And then my ex was also from Iowa. So um, I I agree with you there that there are, for me, like Seattle is just home. If I see anything, if I see the Space Needle, I like cry and I'm just like, oh "Oh my God, I'm home. Like Mount Rainier, just, it's it's an amazing feeling of home. But um, definitely like being on any kind of farm, like brings me back to Iowa and has a feeling of home. Um, yeah. I was going to say, like, if I see cornfields, just immediately. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm like, like, plants in general. <laughs> like, I have my whole garden out on my balcony and plants all in my apartment. And yeah. just being around plants and nature for me is, like, a major home feeling. I definitely feel that. I never even really made that connection for me, but I've always had to have some sort of backyard because, like, I – and, like, a very green one, not mm-hmm. – Sadly, not like a super drought tolerant one, yeah. but I, it, it needs to feel more, I guess, Midwestern for me. But mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, and I mean, because you you were in South Dakota, is that right? Yeah, yeah. I've never been there, but I imagine that it is somewhat green. It's very green. It's, I mean, it's the same. It's very similar to Iowa, mm-hmm. um, but I just I move so much and I'm traveling so much that I'm mm-hmm. always in a new place so I think that for me for the, other than like uh, just Iowa most of the time for me it's not a location because mm-hmm. I've I've I move almost every year at this point yeah wow that's a lot of moving it's a lot of moving is this like moving totally different states and cities um it it varies I mean from Iowa to South Dakota San Diego LA I lived in LA for eight years and I lived in six different apartments or houses in those eight years. Wow. So it's just a lot of, I guess I'm a little stir crazy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, I was going to ask you as I was again, doing my stalking on your Instagram, um, that you travel a lot and that you kind of consider yourself a little bit of a nomad. And one thing people always ask me that I love hearing from other people too, is like how you take care of your mental health when you are traveling, like how you practice that self-care and how you maintain those check-ins and what do routines look like while you're traveling? It's definitely harder when you're traveling. And I think there's a bit of a learning curve there. Um, but for me, two of the, I, you would, I could say easiest things, but I guess when you're traveling, they're not always that easy, is making sure that I'm still eating well, which is mm-hmm. so hard sometimes in certain countries yeah. um, to be able to find healthy, organic, clean type of food. And unless I'm staying in a place that has a kitchen, which will make it a lot easier. Mm-hmm. Um, and working out. Those two things are so important to me because I just don't feel, I f- almost feel mentally foggy if I don't stay on top of some sort of regimen with eating and working out. And it doesn't need to be crazy. I don't need to be going to some like circuit training class every day while yeah. I'm traveling, but just doing something, mm-hmm. whether it's a hike or going to a 30 minute class or doing yoga in the hotel room or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How do you manage that? within your relationship as well? Um, It's pretty easy within uh, my relationship because my husband was a a pro soccer player. Well, there you go. So (laughs) those things are very important to him as well. (laughs) Well, I mean, he sounds like a great match for you then in that sense (laughs) that um, someone that, you know, also values the uh, the things that are considered self-care for you and that help you cope with uh, depression and anxiety and knowing that not only does he value them, but also kind of knows how to put those into practice too. So that worked out well. Yeah, definitely. Definitely worked out well, especially since he uh, no longer plays every day. He is much more on top of his own Mm -hmm. diet and working out because he's trying to stay in the same shape. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you... I'm just so in, impressed, A, that anyone writes books. Like I just, I feel like it's a, such, <laughs> it is such an accomplishment. Um, and I did a, about a month, I can't even keep track of months anymore. Um, in April, I did my first live podcast event and one of the oh, questions, cool. yeah, it was, it was super awesome. Um, 
definitely would love to do another one. Um, but it was, we talked a lot about kind of like female entrepreneurship and kind of being, being your own boss and kind of being a, a hustler as well and how you actually celebrate your successes. And it was kind of a question that like stumped a few of the other women as to like, well, I don't, I just keep going on to the next thing. Um, and so I, I want to ask you, how have you celebrated your book? It's really funny because I was just having this conversation with Jordan, my husband, because mm-hmm. he he is a celebrator and I am not. Hmm. It's just like celebrating myself feels very unnatural for some reason. Yeah. Um, it almost makes me uncomfortable because, well, I obviously it is a big triumph to write a book and publish it. To me, I still don't feel like it's something that I should celebrate unless it like became a successful book, if that makes any sense. Even then I may still feel uncomfortable. (laughs) You feel like it will be successful when it something, something, something that there are like these qualifier, qualifier fires (laughs) to it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I think that I, I have qualifiers attached to it, but then I also just think it's something with my nature. Even when I hit those qualifiers, there'll be a new round of qualifiers. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, now this has to happen because we've reached these. What's the next goal? And Mm -hmm. I think I'm just, I'm very pragmatic when it comes to like planning things out. So, and I'm just, I don't know. I, I don't really celebrate my own successes. And I, I think that maybe I should, but I don't know. Well, what do you what do you do to celebrate your successes? <laughs> Did you um, have a good answer? <laughs> <laughs> my, I honestly, I don't totally remember what I said. Um, but I know for me, it's usually I, I just, I take time to like decompress and like to not do anything. Um, and the things that I do are really just to like refuel me. Um, so, I mean, even after, after I did that event, I had to go do a bunch of other stuff like immediately afterwards. So it kind of took a little bit of attention away from that. But once Mm -hmm. I, once I came back home and everything, I really, I just took probably close to like a week and a half. It was realistically like two weeks um, (laughs) where I literally, I just focused on my garden and hanging out with Lily, my cat and catching up with my friends and I guess, you know, all those kind of little dates together with friends were little mini celebrations. Um, Mm -hmm. But it wasn't anything like huge that I did to celebrate. Um, I'm really curious for you because like if, if someone had like planned a celebration thing and been like, here's a celebration. I would have been like, oh, this is fantastic. <laughs> Let's celebrate. Um, but I just didn't have the mental capacity to kind of do anything like that. Um, but for you, it almost sounds like some of that attention on like you being the one that like people are celebrating yeah. feels uncomfortable and that like you don't want that attention. Yeah, I definitely get a comfortable, uncomfortable with that kind of attention. And mm-hmm. it's, I like, I love planning parties for other people, but I don't like them being planned for me. So that might have something to do with it. Just not mm-hmm. really wanting to have something that's focused solely on me. I mean, even at my own wedding that just happened, I kept like trying to <laughs> turn the spotlight on other people. <laughs> and my my mom at one point was like, this is your wedding. What is wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think that it makes sense. I mean, I, I know we only talked kind of briefly a little bit about um, about the anxiety that, that you struggle and, and manage now, but it's it makes sense not wanting that that attention um, that it could cause a lot of anxiety that focus on you. Um, yeah, definitely. And one thing I think it's it's so hard because I I think that especially female entrepreneurs, I think that um, women who are you know really doing badass shit sometimes feel like they don't deserve to celebrate or that it still isn't necessarily good enough or that, um, that they're going to be shamed if they do celebrate and they're like proud and loud that people are going to be like, no, stop. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I think that definitely is the case. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard to celebrate your successes. It is because sometimes it almost, I mean, I, I get uncomfortable in like a personal sense 
I get a little anxious and just wanting to hide from the spotlight. But also, so it can just feel like you're bragging. Mm-hmm. But I don't ever, I never feel that way about other people. Yeah. So it's really just something that's inside my own head or women's heads where we think that, oh, we can't celebrate it or everyone's going to think that I'm bragging about this. Mm -hmm. But I've never seen any of my friends accomplish something and then celebrate it. And I've never thought, oh, they're bragging. I'm like, what an amazing accomplishment. Yeah. So I'm curious if we put ourselves in Avalon, a world free of self-doubt here, um, of what that celebration could look like for you. If there was no self doubt, and if there was no like, <laughs> if there was no um, you know worry of like, is someone going to think I'm bragging? Like, what would that look like? That would. That's a very difficult question. You <laughs> know, um, I'm like I'm trying to think of that. Um, it would be great to live in a world like Avalon and not have the self doubt aspect. Or just Mm -hmm. even to live in a world, I clearly created a world that I thought would have been amazing to live in, in my unbiased opinion. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think think it still would be because of how I am. It'd be a small celebration. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And probably just with people that I still feel like closest with. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I mean, it'd be something small or, I don't know, it's sometimes... I feel like traveling for me can be a bit of a celebration. Yeah. Like going on a trip to celebrate something, but you never Mm -hmm. really vocalize that that's what it's for. Yeah. Um, It's not like a big party where everyone is cheersing to you. You're Mm -hmm. just like, I celebrate by being like, oh, I've always wanted to go here. Let's plan this trip. And then it just kind of is an unspoken celebration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I like that a lot. Um, when I was thinking about the podcast event, that was actually really difficult to think of how I celebrated it. But um, I recently have gone back to counseling and I did actually take a moment to celebrate that. It wasn't like a dinner or party or anything. It was just by myself. And I literally just kind of like sat there and like cried. <laughs> <laughs> But that was like my celebration. It was like, yeah. it was lots of like words of affirmation and gratitude that I spoke to myself to be like, I am so proud of you. Like you are a boss ass bitch. Look at you. Like, this is great. And I was just kind of like my own cheerleader in my own head for a second. Um, I don't know if if you ever practice that, but I kind of want you to for writing your book. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, sometimes that's exactly what you need. A lot of times it's like just time with yourself. Mm -hmm. That's the most important. Yeah, it is. And for me, and I'm guessing even for you too, part of that time too was like going into therapy. Like my therapist is awesome. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. She definitely helps with a lot. (laughs) Um, And I'm... I'm really curious about so many different aspects of your life. And I'm like, there's so many other questions that I have for you. Um, (laughs) I'm like, I would love to learn more about your relationship and more about your therapy and just everything. Um, But I saw that you also have like your own foundation as well um, that focuses on like restoring our oceans. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. holy shit, girl, like what don't you do? This is amazing. (laughs) It's, I mean, I, at the very beginning, I think one of the first words I even said on this podcast was compartmentalized. Yeah. And a lot of my life is compartmentalized. Um, but just like the foster um, care work that my mom does, my dad has also had his own foundation my whole life called the Weight Foundation, which is just our last name. And it is primarily for ocean conservation and just environmental preservation in general. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also some other like scientific research um, in crazy scientific stuff like biophotonics and things that mm. sound incredibly boring but are incredibly important. Mm-hmm. But he's really passionate about kind of saving the oceans. And I mean, it's a lot bigger than the not using a plastic straw yeah. issue that's going on right there's now. There's a there's a lot to be done with those. Shows. Yeah, it's I mean, plastic straws make up for a very small percentage of the actual waste in the oceans, but overfishing is a huge issue that we mm-hmm. deal with. Um and we work directly with governments actually to kind of delegate these uh marine protected areas called MPAs um mm-hmm. through our foundations institute called the blue prosperity coalition 
So yeah, it's, you know, just working all over the place. Just my <laughs> scattered mind. <laughs> just casually, you know. Um, no, that's such important work. I mean, that's one of the reasons I don't... I'm, I'm very particular when it comes to my diet and... It's very, very rare that I will eat seafood. Um, and mm-hmm. a large reason that I don't is because I really don't like the process of how it is caught. Um, and not yeah. wanting to support that industry, um, to me, it's very important that I vote with my dollars. And so if I am eating seafood, then it's things that are like, you know, sustainably caught and like uh, yeah. local and, and all of that and people that I actually really trust. Um, so that's that's really, really wonderful that that you're part of that and that your family is doing that work. Um, and I'm, I'm curious if you can touch a little bit on like how doing that work has kind of impacted your life and kind of your, whether it's diet related in terms of the ocean or just lifestyle, like how that's impacted you. Uh, yeah, it's definitely impacted me in a whole variety of ways. Um, like you mentioned with eating fish, um, it's made me very particular and probably very annoying to many people. Mm-hmm. Yep, <laughs> I feel that on the same. Level. <laughs> but when you know, it's almost like one of those things where it's like ignorance is bliss. Like when you know too much, it's mm-hmm. you can't ignore it. So when yeah. I know that like big fishing companies are trawling the ocean floor and ruining the reefs, and not just causing certain fish to become endangered, but actually wiping out the entire economy of small island countries Mm. that I'm like, is that worth me eating that piece of tuna right now? No, not at all. Uh, So little things like that, definitely. Um, But it's just on the broader sense, it has really opened my eyes to how different government systems work and how these countries, how much they rely on their own small um like systems of economy Mm -hmm. that are being completely wiped out not just by fit like big fishing companies um which is what we deal with directly but when you deal with it you see that they're also being wiped out by other giant corporations and things like huge hotels coming in and buying up massive plots of land and that Mm -hmm. kind of stuff um but it just it really opens your eyes to how much how important small and local businesses are not just here, it's definitely still very important in the U.S., but outside the U.S., it's like completely integral to their yeah. way of life. Yeah. Dang. I have so many more questions. I'm like, I want to get into this <laughs> so bad. Um, yeah. Even when I had initially like done my research on you, you know, like the book was super interesting and um, loved that you were passionate about mental health and with supporting the foster care system and raising awareness about these things. And then I saw like the oceans thing and I was like, oh my goodness, like these are all fantastic things. I'm so glad she's doing this work. Um, and I'm curious if there's other things that, um, that you could share with us that someone maybe would not know who picked up your book or ordered or ordered it. Um, other things that that you're passionate about and that are like dear to your heart. Um, right now, something that's really uh, that I'm really passionate about that I'm kind of trying to work on is I'm trying to open a new institute within my family foundation that works solely. Um, with spreading awareness of human trafficking. Mm, mm -hmm. And it's a huge passion project for me, which is always a weird thing to decide how to word this Mm -hmm. because then it sounds like I'm passionate about human Human trafficking. Yeah, Mm -hmm. (laughs) But it's, it's just something that it actually came up because of all of our work with um, ocean conservation is how closely tied the big fishing companies are to human trafficking. Really? Sounds crazy. And in the briefest way possible, basically a lot of um, people are being sold into human trafficking and slavery situations through like the fish trade. And Mm. that kind of opened my eyes a few years ago and I started looking more into it. And then I realized that, that while that is happening and is a huge issue, it's happening very substantially within the United States which is something that I don't think people really realize. Hmm. And I, whenever I've brought it up to people like in my network, everyone seems to think it's kind of like a Liam Neeson taken thing where it's happening in 
Asia or Eastern Europe, but it's literally happening in the U.S. And mm-hmm. three of the top 10 hubs for it are in our cities in California. Mm. Wow. So it's something that I really want to bring awareness to, but I've been working with other foundations who are already doing the work to try and educate myself as much as possible before I actually dive mm-hmm. into it. Yeah. Yeah. I know there's an organization here in Seattle. I went to one of their meetings. Uh, I want to say it was like last year and learned a little bit more about what they're doing. And then there's another one actually that reached out to me. Uh, they were doing a, a walk to raise awareness um, early June and I wasn't able to make it, but um, I actually might speak at their um, like annual gala event, charity event thing um, in November, I think it is, um, and like be their MC for. And they're this you know organization that essentially provides um, resources to girls getting out of human trafficking. Um, and That's amazing. It, yeah, it is. It's it's crazy because we don't think about it, but it really is a big issue. And I think the the um, What's the word I'm looking for? The things that happen after it, the mm-hmm. uh, the consequences of the aftermath of being involved in that, I think, yeah. um, does require so many resources and a lot of help. And um, it is so important to raise that awareness for that. Uh, that's amazing that you're that you're looking to partner with people and adding that passion onto your list and just doing amazing work. <laughs> you know, just trying to really diversify. Yeah. <laughs> I knew that there would be other things. I was like, I know there's already like a lot here, but I'm like, I have a feeling. Um, you're like, you're very empathetic. And I think it's fantastic that you're doing the work that you're doing. I think that the book is like super helpful for young readers, but especially like honestly anyone of any age. Um, but especially uh, young adults just kind of with these elements of friendship and home and finding belonging and um, again, breaking a lot of that stigma around mental health that it doesn't have to be something um, that your mental illness doesn't have to be something that, you know, brings you down or is your fault flaw that can be something that, you know, in some ways you can use to your advantage. And I just think yeah, it's beautiful. Definitely. And I think even just like the more we talked about it when you had asked earlier um, how mine, how I use or view my mental illness as a positive, I think that kind of the feeling of being stir crazy and having to have my hands in all these baskets and always doing all these things is a lot to do with my own depression and anxiety. It kind of fuels me to stay super busy and on top of things. And I'm also, as you just said, very empathetic. So I feel very strongly about many different causes. But I Mm -hmm. think that without that, I might be content to just have one job and only do one thing. But I'm always looking for more almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting uh, thirst to clench. (laughs) (laughs) Acting like I have some wisdom here. Is that the right phrasing to you? Um, Maybe it's that I'm always trying to quench this thirst and I just don't know if it'll ever happen. <laughs> the thirst to help people that also yeah. struggle with some anxiety. Um, and again, even I think everyone feels um, a certain layer of anxiety before Definitely. it has to be a actual disorder or mental illness. Um, so yeah. it literally is something that everyone can relate to and that so many people um, could can benefit from just hearing someone talk about it. Um, so yeah, I'm super, super happy that we got connected and that, uh, that you did open up and share with us today the things that you did. Um, super appreciate your vulnerability and um, I hope people will definitely check out the book. Um, do you want to share a little bit about where people can find you? I know I already said I stalked you on Instagram. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if you want to uh, tell people a little bit about where they can find you. Yeah, the the book can be found most easily on Amazon, Band of Shadows. It's uh, HP Weight is my pen name. Um, you can also find me on my website, which is bandofshadowsbook.com. And my Instagram is Hales, H-A-I-L-E-S-S. My name is actually Haley, not H-P, but Mm -hmm. 
just had to have a little pen name. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love it. <laughs> a little alter ego. <laughs> little, little bit of an alter ego, you know, keep, just one degree of separation for the book. <laughs> yes, yes, I love it. Oh, well, thank you so, so, so much for um, coming on and sharing all of this with us today. I mean, you're just really a go-getter and are doing... <laughs> amazing things. And I might have to have you on again to talk about other things. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you so much having me on and it's been a blast. I can't believe that we've been talking for nearly an hour. That just, <laughs> it went by so quickly. Um, yes. But yeah, I'm definitely open to talking again or Awesome. You know, just you can continue to stalk me and I'll stalk you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. We'll just, it's interesting. That is how most friendships uh, actually are. That's how they're days. all starting now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. And I'm glad it went fast. I think it's interesting because um, it, an hour sounds like a long time, but usually almost every episode once we get started and at the end, people are like, wow, that went really, really quickly. So I'm glad it hopefully wasn't um, a, you know, daunting experience getting back into the flow of things after your wedding. Um, Just jumped right in. Yes. And I hope you take some time to maybe celebrate, you know, not only your relationship, but also the success of your book and whether it's, you know, a small uh, words of affirmation to yourself or a trip or a hike or whatever, um, that you do acknowledge your success here and that, you know, the the fact that you accomplished just writing it and putting it out and self-publishing it and it's your first one, there is so much to celebrate there um, without putting qualifiers on it that it has to reach, you know, whatever or be whatever, but just that just the fact that it is and that it came to be. Um, I hope you do take the time to to celebrate that a little bit. I definitely will. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And thank you guys so much for making it through all the way to the end of this episode. I hope that you guys enjoyed talking with Wait as much as I did. Um, so many great things that she's working on and I just want to be a part of all of them. Um, the links for her books, for her book and the um, different organizations that we talked about today are going to be linked in the episode notes. So make sure to check those out. And as always, I love reading your guys' reviews on iTunes and seeing also, like where you guys listen to the episode, there was a re- review this week, um, last week actually, of someone saying that they listen in their kitchen and that it's their kitchen jam. <laughs> and I just love that, like picturing you guys in your kitchen, kind of cleaning up and making dinner and listening to it and that you felt like you were just chatting with a friend. And I just found that so heartwarming. Um, so thank you so much. And if you're in your kitchen now, I hope you have a fantastic meal or just had a fantastic meal. Um, and yeah. Love love your reviews on there. So make sure you guys head on over there. If you have the time to leave one, that would be fantastic. Um, and then if you have any topic uh, suggestions or questions, you can shoot us an email at ask.letstalkaboutit at gmail.com. And that does it for today's episode. Um, I hope that you guys walk away and find something that you've done this week because I guarantee you there is something. And take a moment to celebrate it. Whatever that looks like for you, um, celebrate that and give yourself that grace um so yeah that does it and uh i'll talk to you guys next time this podcast is brought to you by wave podcast network check out all of our shows including the brain candy podcast i don't get it coffee convos and let's talk about it